everyone. Thank you all for coming out on a beautiful Saturday. Uh, my name is Shramoyi Mitra and I'm the curator of Contemporary Art. Um, we are really excited to be here today for uh, the panel discussion titled Peripheral Vi Visions, Spatial Practices, Cultural Heritage and Politics. Um, I will introduce our, um, our moderator and then um, and she will take it away. Uh, so we're really excited to have Jamili Hassan, esteemed artist um, uh, uh, from Canada. Uh, I will read very briefly uh, uh, from the bios. All the bios are um, on your seat. Um, Jamili Hassan's diverse multimedia works deal directly with questions of colonialism, patriarchy, materialism, censorship, sexuality, and cultural identity. Based in London, Ontario, Jamili's broad program of travel in Canada, Mexico, Cuba, Europe, and the Middle East, and other parts of Asia have strongly influenced her work. A visual artist, she's also a lecturer, writer, and independent curator. Uh, since the 1970s, she has, strongly, she has exhibited widely in Canada and internationally. Uh, we're really happy to have you, Jamili. Thank you um, for uh, being here today. And, uh, um, okay. Thank you. And I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Sri It's always a pleasure to come to Windsor. It's uh, a second home in many ways for some of us in London, Ontario. And um, I've had the opportunity to show here over many decades, so it's a real pleasure to come back and to welcome our speakers for this afternoon. Um, really outstanding collection of exhibitions here. I congratulate you here um, at the Art Gallery of Windsor for holding up a, you know, a really high bar. <laughs> Just, uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, and so thank you for um, um, inviting me to moderate. Just a second here. Is that better? Um, I just want to begin by, uh, you know, situating a little bit my thoughts about coming up here today, because um, the drive of coming here is always such a, a different kind of drive than the drive <laughs> going to Toronto, uh, and one which I actually appreciate. And uh, for some reason, looking at um, at all these shows, I don't know why, but. I, I kind of got into reading Edgar Allan Poe again, <laughs> and never more. I don't know why, but um, and one of the people who wrote about Edgar Allan Poe was William Carlos Williams, and one of the things he said was talking about the local, the idea of place, situating, and site, and these important histories, and I found that absolutely, utterly wonderful and important because one of the things he speaks about in what Edgar Allan Poe was able to accomplish in his short life died when he was in his 40s, um, was, to, to quote from his reference to Edgar Allan Poe, was, being thoroughly local in origin has some chance of being universal in application. Which I, I think it, it, the more specific you are about the projects that you're working on, the more rich it is and how further it embellishes and moves people towards a fuller meaning of their own time, not just a particular historical time but this layering of time and space. So, um, yes, I want to thank Ron Banner for driving us here. It was a beautiful drive. And John Riley, librarian, um, who works at Baldwin Library at the University of Western Ontario. Um, <clears throat> totally appropriate in, in many respects for this um, occasion. And uh, this whole idea of a conversation on spatial practices, cultural heritage, and politics with artists and curators is one that is very close to my own heart. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome um, our, our traveler, well, our furthest traveler, Bafa Bella, and uh, Lisa Hermer, and Jocelyn uh, Malosh. <clears throat> In our car drive to Windsor today, um, this morning, t we noticed two things that were quite outstanding in the landscape. One, the oil pump, and the other, the windmill. As Ron said, the windmill being the alternative to the oil pump. Uh, so we all are you know, very familiar with many things that are happening here in Canada, and one of them being the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is um, outstandingly significant in terms of our own coming to terms with crises, trauma, and these various narratives and testimonials questioning um, and bringing forward what needs to be addressed between First Nation communities, Indigenous communities, Native and non-Native. So when we are here today in Windsor, uh, I always like to sort of position our, our relationship to indigenous populations and the importance of us continuing in that um, dialogue. 
and continuing um, reconciliation. We also talked about the absence of snow and the question around ecology and those questions, and uh, this is on the drive up. And um, this, uh, you know, the car and the peripheral vision of the car as we're driving and how that evoked many of the questions that I'm sure will get discussed today. Um, so to simply sort of say that yes, I concur, it is politics. Yes, I concur, and I think many of you that are here today um, recognize the everyday in our lives as art. And um, so in terms of the cultural heritage, the question of cultural heritage and where we uh, position ourselves, sometimes we have to do that hard work that Antonio Gramsci talked about, and that is building an inventory, building that, uh, building that narrative and recognizing what has been lost and moving forward and rebuilding. Mm -hmm. So all of these projects that we see here today, and that's a really important part, I think, in terms of my situating myself here as a moderator, because appear, you know, apparently when you're looking at the bulletin, you know, you might say, well, how do these three projects sit together? How do they dialogue with each other? And they're not thematic, which I, I, I really congratulate, but they're deeper than that. They go further than that in terms of asking the viewer to make connections between how each one of these exhibitions speak to each other. Uh, so I'm actually going to begin um, in the order that we are sitting, um, and uh, I want to uh, salamu alaikum, and Wafa uh, Belal, who is an Iraqi-born artist. Um, and I'll just read. You have the CV here, but um, I'll just read a little bit to kind of verbalize it, to, because we really we're all gathered here together, and that's the significant part mm -hmm. of a gathering like this is that we're not online. We're not just reading this text that someone mailed to you. You're actually going to say, I went to this, and you missed it. Uh, oh, Baghdad? Baghdad. Okay. Um, a city um, of prominence and significance in historically and obviously today ongoing in terms of the uh, Middle East and ongoing crisis there. Um, <clears throat> online performance, work, internationally well-known interactive work provoking dialogue about international politics, internal dynamics, and so many installations and international projects, including the Venice Biennale in 2015. In 2008, City Lights published Shoot an Iraqi Art, Life, and Resistance Under the Gun. About Bilal's life and the domestic tension project, he holds a BFA from the University of New Mexico and an MFA from the School of Art Institute in Chicago. His work can be found in the permanent collections of Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Los Angeles, Museum of Contemporary Photography, Chicago, Mataf Art Museum, Doha, Qatar. Congratulations, that's a great museum and collection. And um, so I invite you to uh, begin your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for the introduction. And I wanted to start by thanking the uh, Art Gallery of Windsor for giving us the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, particularly, I wanted to thank Surmoy uh, uh, Mutra for her uh, great effort uh, in the last five years working together on a project. And it's really nice to see it coming together and have the effect that it should have at this particular time. Um, I get to start by uh, putting this project in the context of my other practices and how I arrived to, uh, to it. Uh, I arrived in, um, in the United States uh, in, in 1992 uh, as a young artist uh, who never studied. And um, I realized something uh, very striking, which is uh, the disconnect between these two zones, the comfort zone I exist in, in the United States, and the complex zone, which is Iraq. And I both connected to these two places. Uh, one is uh, physically I live in, the other one is emotionally I exist in. And um, what also strikes me is the lack of engagement between these two uh, zones. And I did my practice as uh, an artist, as an activist, who liked to bring some of these uh, uh, dialogue together between these two places. Uh, but things uh, evolved rapidly and unexpectedly. In uh, 2004, I received uh, uh, news that is, uh, my brother Haji was killed by an air, uh, an American uh, air-to-ground missile in, in our hometown, Kufa, Iraq. 
And honestly, for the three years after that, I did not know what to do with the news. And I don't think I comprehend or accepted my losses, uh, not until three years later, when I was watching an American soldier having an interview from Colorado, and that soldier was directing drones uh, to Iraq and dropping bombs. <coughs> and it struck me how the soldier is disconnected physically, emotionally, from what is happening on the ground um, in, in Iraq. And I immediately called my gallery and I said, uh, I'm going to do a project called Shoot an Iraqi, in which I lock myself in a room for an entire month, build a robot, and allow people from everywhere in the world to shoot at me with a paintball. And um, I think I was naive enough to think nobody going to shoot. Uh, in one month, we received 80 million hits on the site, and I was shot about 70,000 uh, times. That project functioned as miniature conflict zone within the comfort zone. When I walked in, I did not bring any food, any water with me, and even not even paintball supplies. So the community sustained that project, and it became timely important project because it was 2007, the highest of the war of, uh, in Iraq, and people needed a platform to come and dialogue about it. Um, when I started the project, the gallery was uh, completely white. Uh, I moved in the entire my space, my computer, my bed into it, and things evolved rapidly because I did not uh, expected this, uh, how much uh, interaction we're going to get, and this is um, the last day, one of the last day wow. uh, of uh, the project, and you could see how the place was destroyed completely to uh, the ground. Uh, <clears throat> to connect people, uh, outside the physical space, I start doing video every day, a uh, 10 minute video, uh, and, and, and post it online of what happened on, uh, in, on any particular uh, day. Uh, in day 14, particularly, I received a massive amount of uh, shooting and I did not know why. Uh, but apparently, uh, the project made it to a dig.com, dig which is an online rating of something happening on the internet. And in that day uh, alone, I think I received about 20,000 uh, shots. And here is a quick video of that. Okay, everybody, it's day 14. This has been insane because uh, what happened is it was hit uh, .com and the place has been completely bombarded, non-stop for the last two, three hours. And you could see it's absolutely a trap. So much, I mean, to the point you cannot, not a single second. I cannot even, um, I cannot even keep a try, a jeep, keep falling, filling the pot here. Dick.com, this is really disturbing. This is nonstop. I cannot keep track of this. I cannot fill these people fast enough uh, to, to keep with the demand. Okay. I'll let you go because I think uh, I cannot do the camera and cannot do this play. So uh, I'll just uh, have to run uh, back and forth. Uh, see, I have to run back and forth between um, uh, the, between. <coughs> see, see, now I'm, I'm taking hit. I'm taking hit for them. There you go. See, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely non non-stop, and this is so disturbing right now. Okay, okay, I, I can I go in a, in a, in a safer place. Uh, very, very disturbing, but uh, I guess I, I set up the situation. I, um, um, I cannot give up right now, and I won't give up. Uh, all right, um, all right, I'm gonna go and pull it back. <laughs> See this one. Uh, uh. 
Okay, things went on and uh, the project was successful in terms of bringing dialogue together and uh, I ran uh, a chat room um, on, um, and on, on that uh, site and the chat room filled with 3,000 pages of people conversing uh, with each other. I thought that was one of the successful things came out of that project. Uh, later on, I moved um, to uh, make an issue of visibility, uh, specifically the examining the invisibility of the civilian that, but again, I did not want it to create anything didactic, but rather something dynamic and bringing people together um, and bringing awareness about the situation without imposing on people. And I did a project called Encounting, when I um, mapped where every Iraqi uh, was killed in, in Iraq, and uh, uh, at that time I had uh, a list of 100,000 Iraqi and 5,000, uh, 100,000 Iraqi and 5,000 uh, American soldiers. And uh, based on that algorithm map, um, I uh, tattoo my, uh, the cities of Iraq in a visible um, uh, ink on my back, and in a performance that took about um, uh, one day, I allocated one dot uh, for every Iraqi, and this time in an invisible ink, so you don't see it unless there is the black light in the room. So there is just like two things simultaneously going on. One, uh, when you look um, at my back in, in, in the regular light, you see uh, just the cities of Iraq, but when you look at my back and their black light, that issue of visibility become clear. This is the death of the Iraqis. Now we, we start talking about uh, a few, uh, one project that is uh, on display um, uh, downstairs, um, which is the Ashes series. The Ashes series started in 2003 when I uh, start collecting images, press images coming from Iraq of destroyed places. These are cultural places, uh, some people's homes, uh, private homes, uh, publicly uh, ripped open by uh, violence. It struck me these images no longer start registering as war images. And I wanted to slow <laughs> down the process of uh, the viewers looking at these images, but also I want this act to be meditative act, escaping the uh, hard performance uh, I am doing uh, by going into my studio and working slowly, building these images. I will take the image, the press image, then I would slowly start building it in a miniature scale, imbued with ashes, including human ashes, and then at the end you see the result, which is that are on display downstairs. chair, hospital, market, chandelier, Saddam's bedroom, that's the press image, this is my render of it. Uh, one a project now dealing with the post-traumatic stress disorder before we go to 168, um, I noticed that is people like me and soldiers coming from uh, the war in Iraq uh, deal with a serious issue, uh, and that is the post-traumatic stress disorder, and not a lot of people know about it. Um, but when I start searching um, the product, I come across uh, something significant, which is the uh, Muslim and the Arab uh, contribution to the rest of the work. And one of them is Ibn Sina, who is maybe five centuries ago, come up with the idea of treating illness, illnesses with color, including the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so I start uh, talking to soldiers and I built a space in San Antonio at Art Pace where when you walk into it, there is nothing except this threatened structure that is leaning against uh, the wall. But behind it, there is um, an, uh, a, a system when you could dial what colors um, uh, that you wanted to see that affect you. Um, and we find the soldier, which is standing here, and myself being through the same thing, we find the blue is the one that calms us down. But what the 
the viewer did not know is they walk into this space, but as soon as they walk behind the wall, they're confronted with a performer who is uh, a soldier looking at them without saying anything for the entire duration of uh, the show. And now we come into 168 and one uh, second. Uh, 2010, I met Sermoy uh, uh, and we talked about doing something uh, together uh, and specifically about the last of um, books, uh, the last of uh, culture in time of crisis and Iraq and the region have so many um, of them. And when Sermoy came to work with the gallery here, uh, I request to come on a side visit to see the space and I immediately fell in love with it. Uh, so we we uh, the project went through maybe three four phases of what we want to do. Uh, it went from an installation recreating one of these images in life size into a participatory not participatory but rather performance when the bookshelf you see there um, it would have the book and the book fallen and somebody would all the time to bring them back to the shelf and uh, the bookshelf uh, function as this link, the uh, minimum link between gallery uh, A and gallery C, which housed uh, uh, both uh, uh, the Ashes series. Then I think two months uh, before the show, which I, I think Shermoy hate me for that, <laughs> and I could hear it in her thought, I give her a call and I said, Shermoy, I, I changed the idea, and it was silent. <laughs> and then we're looking at each other on Skype, Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, either the girl is gonna just freak out about this uh, and hate me, or she really love it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm so glad she apparently loved the idea I proposed. And I said, okay, we we make art, we come up with these objects, and these objects and their effect disappears. Uh, but what if art uh, become uh, the process open? the democratization of making it, it become available to everybody, and it has a tangible uh, result. And now I will get into the history of this project. In 2003, the College of Fine Art in Baghdad lost their entire collection of 75,000 titles. Unfortunately, it was burned to the ground, never replaced to this uh, day. And, uh, I wanted, when the idea came, just like I wanted to restore that. I got in touch immediately after I talked to Sermoy with the student and the faculty from the college and I said, this is the idea we, I have. They didn't believe what we're going to do because they said we had too many promises, nothing to deliver. I said, listen, you're not going to lose anything. Give me an index of books you want. They said, well, the index was burned just with the books. I said, all right, what about you do some work, I do some work. Um, try to come up with books, titles you want in your library now. And they truly went into start searching. And they're constantly delivering us lists from the faculty, from the student of books they want to um, have in the library. Then we faced with a bigger challenge. And the challenge was money. Uh, how we go to build what we wanted to build here. Uh, the platform and then how we're going to buy the books and uh, ship them. Then the idea of Kickstarter come up, which is a start from the instruction of uh, the college and we thought, okay, this is what we're going to do. We have to involve the people in this project. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to have a meaning as an impact as much as when there are uh, part of it. So we, we put a very a uh, simple uh, campaign on Kickstarter with a modest uh, goal of $9,000. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Kickstarter campaign, I want it to be light. Uh, the history is very dark. Uh, uh, it continue, unfortunately, to be. But I thought, if we are reaching to people, something optimistic has to be done in this two minutes, and not only asking to support, but also giving the history of uh, the uh, region. And that uh, it bring me to the title, 168 hours and one second. Uh, in the 13th century, the Mongolian invaded Iraq. 
and uh, I, in order for them to cross the river from one side to another, they collected all the books, including the House of Wisdom Library, which used to be the largest library in the world, and they dumped it in the river to, cross, to create that bridge. And the story goes that the river ran blue for seven days, and that's the 168 hours, seven days. And then I'm imagining what happened after that one second when the seven days over. The knowledge is drained, the books turn into white, that's what we see downstairs, it's like in the gallery, and that one second, Asher, an optimistic, and uh, Asher, uh, my hope uh, into a new era of construction Iraq and restoring the college library, which meant so many things for the student there. Uh, it meant so much for me as a student there to be able to grab a book and open it as, the, to the, uh, as a window to the world and to inform myself about art and art history. So now the exchange is um, uh, people donate online to, um, uh, to uh, give to our fund. Um, uh, now we're going to make uh, an Amazon list available with all the titles. Uh, that is, uh, people with one click will be able to buy a book of their choice and send it to the library. And over the period between uh, January 29 to April 10, you're going to see the colors of the library uh, change from the white into the fully color restored books, which is the reversal of the 168 hours. And with that, I thank you very much. Um, I think there was something that I read that with um, a select number of people will receive from the 1,000 books that are on the shelf, that the books will be exchanged so that one person will receive yes. in exchange. Yeah. That's really yeah. Okay. So um, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, we'll next hear from Lisa, who is here with us today from Guelph. She works in the overlap between visual art, performance, social practice, design, and experimental forms of research. She creates the majority of her work under the pseudonym Ododo Lab, an experimental artistic practice that is focused on developing productive critical approaches to working with the public, which you know has this uh, tie-in here with um, your, your project, obviously, in that engagement. Um, and bringing forward um, context between different locations and locales. And in your case, um, you, the juxtaposition of the project downstairs in Marginalia um, involves also Andrew Hunter, who's curator, and uh, visited here and selected works from the collection in tandem to elaborate further on what Lisa's photos were representing and the sites um, that her um, photographs are um, representing. So it's um, quite a trajectory from Newfoundland to Fort McMurray to here to Windsor, Ontario. A completely fascinating project. And I love the fact that you've brought that relationship of the margin of the page, another beautiful tie-in, um, and marginalia in, in that whole sort of sense of note-taking and uh, internal thoughts and processes, and moved it into the public realm of architecture and site and location and place and there are two bodies of text so you you'll continue from there and we'll get back to a conversation with the three i, I neglected to ask you srimoy about how many minutes per presentation but i guess we're all comfortable with this informal setup and uh, 15 to 20 minutes i'm glad you asked now, now. <laughs> I didn't do that, I'm sorry, I should have. Well, don't be. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and I also wanted to thank uh, specifically Andrew Hunter, who couldn't be here, um, for curating the show and selecting the works from the collection, and also just encouraging the project. Can you move the microphone closer and make yep. sure it's on? Thank you. Can you hear me better now? No? 
Okay, I'll try to speak loud. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to thank the AGW and also specifically Shamoy for also being very patient with me and Andrew. Um, during that that happened. Um, yeah, you were very brave. <laughs> oh, now I have double microphones. Sure. <laughs> I feel like that. Andrew, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm both me and Andrew. So imagine me and also a much taller, bald man <laughs> both giving this talk. Um, so in the cluster that is my work, I would say marginalia um, is a little bit unusual. Um, my phot photography practice is more of a small piece. Most of what I do is um, under the pseudonym of Dota Lab. Um, and that work is uh, probably doesn't always read as easily as art. It kind of shifts between uh, performance and community-based arts, um, practice-based research, public engagement, and I'm pretty happy for it to kind of be that way. There's a sort of dexterity and um, not being as clear. Um, so I thought what I'd do is I'd talk a little bit about that practice just to situate where marginalia falls in there. Um, so let's go there. Well, okay, we can leave that up. Um, so Dota Lab is about working with the public in public, um, and I use the word public as more of a placeholder than any kind of really clear idea, so it might be more accurate to say a specific public or a temporary kind of collectivity, but that could be a whole 30 minute talk in and of itself, so <laughs> we'll just use that word for now. <laughs> um, and it's focused on working with the nebulous and messy reality that is public idea, so it's never something in and of itself I'm looking at, but an idea or question or issue um, in combination with how the public understands or looks at that idea. Um, mm -hmm. And acknowledging that the idea of public ideas is itself messy and complicated, but in short, it's an idea about how ideas and thoughts move through public space. So we can have one idea of what reality is, so say science tells us something about climate change, but if um, generally, <laughs> collectively, we hold a different idea, that's just as real as the other one. We have to contend with that just as much as any other form of knowledge. Um, oftentimes, the work takes on a form of a kind of performative research, so performing the idea of research, um, as you'll see when I explain a couple of projects, is deeply, very unscientific, uh, very flawed research methods on purpose. <laughs> uh, on the same time, uh, the information and data that gets collected is actually useful. So. You know, I'll never end up with a statistic like 45% of people think that, but the stories and conversations that come out of it, uh, I use that as the material that I work with as an artist. And I won't go on too, too long about Dota Lab. I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm just going to do uh, explain two projects um, as sort of kind of like two poles of that work and then talk about how that relates to marginalia. So this is a project I did in 2014. Uh, called The Passengers, um, and it's a project about the extinction of passenger pigeons. So passenger pigeons would have once uh, occupied no most of North America. They were the most abundant bird species, uh, at least in North America, probably the world. There's some estimate that they were like 50% of all the fauna in North America uh, pre-contact, and uh, 100 years ago they went extinct. So they flew in massive flocks. You can hear historical accounts of it taking days for these flocks to pass. So all of a sudden, you, the skies would darken with these massive flocks of passenger pigeons. And so it was this time of incredible abundance. People could just like shoot a musket into the air and drop a dozen pigeons. And so uh, people would just hunt as much as they could. They would catch massive, you can see these sort of like mountains of passenger pigeon bodies that people would catch as they passed through. Um, and a little bit unusual, they would pass through an area and then not show up. They kind of like devour the landscape. They'd eat all the food and then they wouldn't show up again for a few years. Um, so as the flocks started disappearing, people didn't really register it right away because they just thought they were elsewhere. Um, but once it became clear that the flocks were gone, uh, it was one of the first moments that humans realized they had made something go extinct. So up until then, there was kind of this idea that God put animals here, and if they went away, that was God's will. Humans didn't have a role in that, and that was sort of one of the very first moments that um, humans realized, we did this, and they're gone. And what people think happened is they didn't decline gradually, they hit a critical point, and the flocks weren't big enough to sustain and crashed. Um, so this is a project, um, it's the 100 year anniversary of the death of the last passenger pigeon, who was named Martha. Um, and it's going uh, to different sites in Ontario trying to find traces of their presence. 
So both uh, in places, so this first photo here, that's Pigeon Island, just outside of Kingston. Um, so we have these names, and people think like the rock pigeons we kind of have now, but they would have actually been named after the passenger pigeons that were originally here. Uh, it would have once been treed, and now it's just this like um, desolate island. Uh, also it traces in people, so to, like moving around, talking to people, like do they know what passenger pigeons are, do they know that they're gone. Um, this is near Pigeon River, and the last photo is the ROMS collection, um, their ornithology collection. They have the biggest number of passenger pigeon skins in the world, they have hundreds of them, um, and so the pigeons are looking at pigeons. So the project is a public performance, um, you know, interacting with people at most of the sites, but it's also a research project. So looking at, um, sorry, I'm talking about this for a long time, just uh, trying to understand the story and in the places that it actually inhabited. So an idea about um, how can we explore this knowledge of extinction? Like we know, uh, we know we're experiencing this tremendous loss, but how can we occupy that story in a different way? How can we understand consequences in a different way? So trying to like get inside that story um, and think through what it means to live with this awareness um, in a different way that's neither like really um, dejected nor ignoring it and not separating it from the spaces we move through every day. Um, okay, and this is a little bit different. This is a project uh, about um, peat moss, specifically its capacity to store carbon. Uh, it was a residency through the Center for Contemporary Art and the Natural World, and I was paired with soil scientists looking at uh, carbon storage, specifically in the uh, moors around the kind of southwest coast of England. So this is Dartmoor, which is the site of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, <laughs> and so uh, peat is actually an incredibly important carbon sink. There's about 500 gigatons of carbon in the world's peatlands, which is about half of what's in the atmosphere right now. So if we were to lose that storage, I mean, we'd be done for sure. Uh, interestingly, it's the best terrestrial carbon sink we have because it doesn't decompose. That's why we end up, we end up with peat building up and we can slice it and burn it. Um, so I was working with a scientist to learn about that process and how it works, uh, but at the same time, um, talking with the public in the gallery about the idea of value. So, um, you know, science has one answer about what um, peatlands do and why that's really important. But because um, for carbon storage, we can't really establish a value in the ways we like to, which would be extraction and bringing it to market and putting a price on it um, because we need them to stay for them to store carbon. And right now the tool we have is maybe like carbon tax or carbon credits, uh, which are a bit flawed. So trying to assign monetary value uh, to these um, systems um, and then try to trade them that way. So I designed this survey um, that people would do. They'd come into the gallery and talk to me uh, and do this survey, which was purposely impossible and purposely absurd. So there was a bunch of scenarios that they had to put a price on, um, but they could either like put a monetary price or they could invent their own scale. Uh, almost very few people actually put a monetary price on it. People came up with different scales, some like ranking, sometimes just like describing in words. Uh, some, a couple people did human lives, which was a bit dark. Um, <laughs> and so uh, just, and then they all went up on the wall, and so it becomes kind of this um, portrait of that barrier of that like systemic limit that we don't actually have the capacity to define value beyond our way we like to count things. Uh, and also like the conversations that come out of it uh, were part of the project. So just uh, how we make sense of our relationship with these systems, blah, blah, blah. All right. <laughs> So, um, one way to think about Dota Lab is looking at different um, realities, for lack of a better word, encountering each other, uh, in this case, specifically ideas through public space and acknowledging that that's a real force in the world. Uh, so for the Pete example, we, science says one thing, but uh, people's understanding says something else, which uh, influences our capacity to act on this knowledge. Uh, and the photographs come at this maybe at a slightly different angle, so looking at how <coughs> different forces or realities move through the world and then leave marks in built forms or on the landscapes. So we can't really see social, economic, or political forces, but we can see their effects. Uh, so kind of like gravity, we can't see it, but we can see it acting in the world. Um, and at the same time, I think it is a little bit of a response to the public work. So um, a counterpoint to just talking to people and hearing all these ideas is just seeing what the material world has to say. Almost most of them, not all of them, come from places that I was doing other work in and then seeing things in the landscape. 
it's definitely more of speculative and contemplative um, happening, you know, away. Um, and unlike the work is Dota Lab, it doesn't, ha hasn't so far started as an idea for a project. Um, I don't like imagine myself as a photographer who goes out and like has an idea of photos I want to make. Uh, instead, it, they've always started with noticing something and it, like just kind of being um, obsessed with that, like can't really figure out why I really feel compelled to make photos of it. It's something I don't understand, a feeling like there's something else going on there. And so making the photos is a way of spending the time to look at something uh, and looking at it really specifically. Uh, so the first project started in Fort McMurray, um, seeing what I first thought might be space stations. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned that peripheral vision in the car, and that's exactly what happened. I was doing a Dota Lab project, and the car went by, and I was like, well, is that where they make space stations? Um, and so I just had to go back. I wanted to know what they were and what was going on. Uh, and so the first set of photographs of Fort McMurray, I just kind of made for myself, just as like, what is this? Uh, I'm really interested in this. And then I ended up showing those photographs to Andrew, and he encouraged me to uh, actually think about them as a project. And that's where this idea for marginalia came out of. Um, so it's thinking about buildings in the margins, so making a parallel between marginal spaces um, and the margins of the page. So in this case, this is a small slip of land outside of Fort McMurray itself. Um, but also thinking about individual responses within larger contexts. So in the same way, um, there's an established text and marginalia are these like little quiet personal uh, notes on the side um, looking at uh, like individuals in a bigger context, like what is their voice, what is the room, you know, there's space in the margins, it's not left there for people to write, but uh, it gives you room to have another voice enter there, so what is the equivalent in the built world, like what capacities does an individual have within uh, bigger, like official city plans or housing strategies um, or a established urban fabric. Um, so, but the idea of marginalia is also a way of reading these sites. So very deliberately looking at specific places and Canadian places, they're all Canadian, uh, which I think maybe we're not so good at in Canada, like really looking at our own places, especially small places. Um, but, so it's about looking at these places as these little fragments, like the same way you might see a note in the margin and then you're kind of like, okay, who is this person writing in my book? Um, and just seeing like, what can I trace from what I'm seeing at these specific sites? So then these aren't like really deep research projects where I've spent tons of time doing all this research. It's more about spending time in a place and seeing what stories can be traced while you're there. Like how far can you uh, see how different things are connected? What little pieces start to come together and build a picture? Uh, so in that way, they're more of a speculative narrative than like an academic research project. So coming back to Fort McMurray, um, this is the Centennial RV Park. There are a few other RV parks in Fort McMurray. Uh, this is just the one I spent time in. Uh, it has something of a difference. The other ones have a bit more municipal oversight and this one doesn't. I think it might be just outside of the town's boundaries. It's also privately owned. Um, but the other ones are fairly similar. The same thing happens. They're just a little more tightly packed. Uh, everybody living here works in the oil sands or some kind of support industry around the oil sands. Uh, it's also important to note that this was a few years ago. So these were taken when oil production was at a high, I'm sure it's really different right now. Um, and the city's official housing strategy is about trying to get people to permanently live there. So they're building a lot of like typical suburban homes and they want people to buy them, they want people to move there, uh, which seems a little bit blind to what is definitely gonna happen. Like it's a, gonna be a boom bust uh, cycle. Uh, we, we know that um, it's inevitable, especially now because we know that's true. Um, but that was what the city wanted to do. So these houses would sell for um, like more upwards of a million dollars. And the hope is that you sell before it busts. <laughs> and so uh, even rent costs are really high in Fort McMurray because everyone has really high salaries and there's a high demand for them. Uh, so uh, these sites were people who didn't want to engage in that scenario. Um, they wanted to be able to leave when their jobs were done or if they just wanted to get out of there. And so they bring their RVs and then slowly start to modify them as they stay longer and longer. Um, so it's like this more attentive way of occupying a space. The first step for everybody was always like covering it in this insulation because it gets so cold there, like minus 35, minus 40, and they're outside all day so they don't actually need the windows because they're only there at night. 
Um, but then, as you can see, uh, people start to add different pieces, like there was porches and gardens, outdoor areas, carports. Uh, one of my favorite was a lot of them had heated dog houses. Like you can see this like heating vent go across to like a little house for the dog. <laughs> and so you can see like their living space would almost could get doubled or even more by adding these pieces. Most of them were like shed kits from Home Depot uh, that they would just like buy on sale and then attach. Um, a lot of people mentioned that they moved them between the sites. So like this one guy said he left for a summer and gave his addition to his neighbor and then when he came back, they, <laughs> they brought him back. So a, a few of them have wheels on them. Um, and so yeah, they, they just move around the site and it gives them this flexibility and freedom that you know when you don't want to work in Fort McMurray or you lose your job, uh, you just give your neighbors the additions and drive away. Uh, one man said, uh, he said he's not desperate to keep his job at any cost, and that's why he lives there. Like, so, sort of this idea that he has this agency that maybe other people don't have, where um, if something's happening you're not okay with, but you're tied into this real estate system, you really don't have the agency to say, like, I'm out, I'm done. Uh, whereas everybody here uh, had, like, a different capacity to deal with um, that economy. Uh, so the next site here was Indian Road in Windsor, which I'm sure a lot of people mm -hmm. in this room know better than I do. Um, I was likewise here for other work and just having some conversations about empty storefronts and empty lots and I started to wonder what happens to plants uh, in empty lots and someone said you should go check out Indian Road <laughs> and I discovered this like amazing place where I think maybe at first glance maybe your peripheral vision from the car would say like oh derelict houses but Actually, it's really obvious quite quickly that that's not the story. Uh, you can see that the plants that are overtaking this place are actually like really nice ornamental plants. Um, and so there's something almost fairy tale like about it, like as if the people just went to sleep or just disappeared. Um, there obviously were nice houses and well cared for. You can see all kinds of little details and then they were just left. And I won't like get into details because people here are probably more familiar with the story, but for anybody who doesn't know, uh, in short, the Ambassador Bridge Company, which owns that big blue bridge uh, that goes to Detroit, uh, it's owned by a millionaire named Matty Maroon. Um, he decided to purchase all these houses because he wanted to twin his bridge. Uh, the governments on both sides of the border didn't like this plan, and they declared this a heritage neighborhood, so the houses can't be <laughs> torn down. Uh, but he still owns them, and I think the state is, it's extremely unlikely he's going to get to build his bridge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like it's a very bizarre effect. at one point he tried to get a constitutional amendment um, in order to build this bridge so it's a very convoluted story but as a result um, these houses are left here uh, I sort of liken him to someone who's gone through a book with a sharpie and so instead of like leaving his notes in the margin now he's like really <laughs> starting to affect the urban fabric itself and it's kind of like the flip side to that personal agency. So like he has a lot of agency uh, and like the city is pushing back against him, but he's also like a pretty active character in like marking up this book. Um, there's also something I think about these houses slowly degenerating that pulls my mind back to Fort McMurray, a sort of precariousness in the face of these bigger narratives playing out. So these were like people's houses, people lived here. Uh, and then there's like these big stories that come through their lives and shape them. Um, which brings us to the last site, which is Elliston, which is a tiny town of just a few hundred people in Newfoundland. Uh, this is the only site I specifically went to for this project. Uh, I had the first two and was sort of thinking about this and came across this tiny little story about a place that declared itself the root cellar capital of the world. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, what's that? Um, so like most of Newfoundland, this is a tiny fishing settlement that lost its primary industry with the collapse of the cod stocks. And, uh, like, you know, there was a lot of official strategies, I think, turning towards tourism, but this was like a homegrown, like, they wanted to get tourists there, and they thought by declaring themselves the root cellar capital of the world, they would get, they, I think they thought a lot of people would want to come learn about subsistence living and, like, how to use root cellar. Um, by the time I got there, someone looking at the root cellars was unusual enough that a lot of people were asking me why I was doing it. Uh, so like, it, it didn't really pan out the way they thought. But there was this like puffin colony just outside of town that was really popular. So now they were like all about the puffins. Um, puffin and capita. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, these root cellars would have once been a really, really important part of life here. They didn't get electricity in Elliston until the late 70s or early 80s. 
Yeah. Um, so mm. it would have been really important for keeping your food like both warm, like not frozen in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, and so uh, there's something about this like returning to traces of an old infrastructure that I still find really interesting, even if it didn't work as this tourist strategy, like this kind of purposeful reframing of your own built environment around you. Um, and not unlike for McMurray, I think there's something about this self-sufficiency and agency uh, in the idea of these root cellars. So even though they have access to grocery stores, obviously, um, I mean, even especially now that like for some reason the price of fresh produce has skyrocketed, like I wish I had a root cellar I had stocked in the summer. Um, but yeah, like people were still using them because there was this big restoration project. Uh, most of them were still in use or are in use. Um, and to me, there seems to be like this capacity then to opt out of the way some of our food systems are working. Um, yeah, like they wouldn't have to buy all this expensive California produce. Uh, and, you know, by turning towards these vernacular solutions um, and staying invested in them, it kind of makes us re less reliant in the face of these really big narratives. Um, yeah, I think also given that it's a place that has experienced collapse, that's an interesting approach and an interesting. Uh, Interesting that that's there. Oh, there's another one. And, and another curiosity, the person who lives in this house, which is like this big brand new house, worked in Fort McMurray. Mm. Oh, was, yeah, right, I was going to make that. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay, so now I'm Andrew. Um, <laughs> so Andrew wasn't able to be here, so I'm going to do my best to convey his approaches to selecting from the permanent collection. Uh, and then I'll add my own little spin just because I am here. Um, so one criteria he used was to select mostly works on paper, as those tend to be marginalized within collections. Um, and I think even material, materiality of them are more precarious. Um, and then he tried to respond to the subject matters and places of the photo works. Uh, so one, just looking at this idea of the North, um, I mean obviously that plays pretty large in the Canadian mind and Canadian culture. Uh, so this is Cabin in the Northland, so that's like one idea of what it is to be in the North of Canada. Um, but I think also just echoing ideas of mobility and movement. Uh, this is bad policemen um, who are coming to take these guys away. Um, so there's like a tension between how to occupy a place like this pole of permanence versus a different way of uh, existing in the landscape, a more nomadic, uh, responsive way. Um, and then he was also looking at the edges of urban places. So quite literally the space is just outside of town or across a boundary. Uh, you'll see a lot of like rivers and uh, water bodies, so equating that quite specifically with the spaces on the page, these outside places, but I think uh, this is edge of the city it's called, uh, but also I think maybe spaces where something different can happen, so like a different uh, kind of occupy occupation or activity happening um, in these other spaces. And then likewise, uh, just looking at ideas of the East Coast, um, so maybe a sense of what it was like to live there before the collapse of the fishing economy, which is, I think, both a nice resonance with Elliston and uh, Fort McMurray as well. And uh, the final piece of the exhibition, as was mentioned, is there's two sets of texts, uh, both by me and Andrew. So using these little text pieces um, as sort of personal notes that stitch the whole thing together, uh, acting themselves kind of like marginalia, so not really like didactic panels, but more about what you bring uh, yourself to this work, what you're thinking about, um, just different ideas that get pulled in. Uh, so like finding notes in a book, you might not even know what the person is talking about. I think in some of Andrew's notes, he mentions uh, people who may, you may not know who they are, uh, but it's about opening these little glimpses into like a uh, thought process or another world, and so that's kind of how they stitch together. And I've probably gone over time, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. And one of the images that I'm <laughs> What I found quite striking um, was Frederick B. Taylor's uh, painting of downtown Detroit, Michigan, from the River Park View, Windsor, that he did in 1953. This little gem that sits there, and it's actually like <laughs> it is. It is pretty much that view, isn't it? Um, so I come to uh, Justin Malosh, and um, welcome from Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Ottawa based artist working in, again, um, multiple roles here uh, fields of drawing and performative and feminist art history. And uh, she holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Ottawa, a Master of Arts in Canadian Art History from Carleton University, a Master of Fine Arts from the School of Visual Arts, 
and a research, uh, and she has just completed um, her research creation led PhD in humanities and fine arts at Concordia University. In her own words, she's completed it, blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> well, many of us can relate to that. Uh, even if we didn't do a PhD, we watched all the others who were doing, doing that. She's a part-time professor in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Ottawa. And you know, I, mean, I think one of the um, important aspects of Alma Duncan, this retrospective, is how interdisciplinary her practice is and was. Um, and continues its relevance and uh, the work of excavating this narrative of um, a woman's <coughs> practice that is often not given enough attention in Canadian art history. So I really am pleased to have the opportunity to see the show and to hear you address some of the yeah. issues within the show. Absolutely. And the politics of, <laughs> politics, that's <laughs> of her activism. That's well. how I fit into the title of this mm -hmm. panel. Can mm -hmm. everyone hear me? Is this better? This mm -hmm. is good? Okay. Um, Thank you. I would like to thank my fellow panelists. I'd also like to thank the Windsor Art Gallery, Shimoy, um and Catherine Mastin, Aston, as well as thank my co-curator, Catherine Sinclair, who is not here today. Um, Catherine is on maternity leave this year, so I am traveling solo, um, as well as Rebecca Bastiano and um, the support from Heritage Canada's uh, museum assistance program that helped fund the exhibition as well as its tour. Um, so the Alma Duncan exhibition, Alma, the life and art of Alma Duncan, has been touring for two years. This is its final stop. It opened in uh, on October 2nd, 2014 in Ottawa at the Ottawa Art Gallery, where it was until January, and then it went directly to the Varley Art Gallery in Markham, Ontario. And from there, it went directly to uh, Sarnia and the Judith and Norman McClair, um, Alex Art Gallery in Sarnia. And so this is its final stop. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be, to be here to talk to you about Alma Duncan. Um, what I'm going to do today, I, I did give a curatorial talk earlier. So instead of um, repeating myself, I'm going to tell you in my own words, how Alma Duncan happened, how I came across Alma Duncan, and why um, this exhibition is so politically necessary beyond just being a retrospective and celebration of a, of a life, of a, of a career. And so, um, and, and how it made me a feminist art historian. I'm very <laughs> proud to, to use that title um, in many ways. So. Uh, in 2001, which is when I was first, I first came across Alma Duncan's name. I, I had just finished a BFA in in studio, and I naively thought that feminist art history meant that you had an engagement and in, an interest in women artists' work. I was 22 at the time, and and I I didn't, I didn't. I had not yet experienced that sort of that urgency and that necessity of a feminist recovery project. And I loved writing, so before pursuing an MFA, I decided to pursue an MA in art history. And that was only because Natalie Lixke had invited me to work with her. Natalie Lixke was one of the, we could call her spearheading faces, um, trailblazers of the Feminist Recovery Project coming out of um, King, uh, Queen's University. She was part of the um, founding directors of the Agnes Etherington Art Center. Her and Dorothy Farr published a very extensive, one of the first um, surveys on Canadian women artists alongside Maria Tippett. So Nat Natalie was at Carleton with, with a feminist mandate and so I went there to work with her and part of her research project within this recovery project was she would go into the archives and and bodies and bodies of work she would select an artist research put together a catalog curate an exhibition it would be a five-year project and then she would move on to the next archive and she had just finished um, her research on Helen McNichol the book had come out the catalog exhibition had come out the exhibition had toured and Alma Duncan was her latest project. And she, as an early grad student, we had to do this, a, a long-term research project, and she proposed it to me as a topic. I had never heard of Alma Duncan's name. Um, I had studied Canadian art history at the University of Ottawa. It was not a name that I had ever read about, or I didn't know what to expect. 
And so Natalie and I met, and she gave me a folder and said, go home, read it, we'll meet in a few weeks. And that was the last time I saw Natalie Lipsky. She then, for the next three months, appointments kept getting canceled. And I was finally told right before the holidays that she had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So I'm a new graduate student. My advisors passed away. There was not anyone else on faculty who had, I don't want to say an interest, but who had an engagement and um, with feminist art history. And Natalie's husband was on faculty, and, and he quite literally gave me Natalie's filing cabinet on her research and said, good luck. And so I started in an archive, in the archives. And all I could find at the time, so in, in that folder that Natalie had given me was probably the most important piece of information that I've ever been given in terms of Alma Duncan, was the finding aid. The Alma Duncan and Audrey McLaren finding aid at the National Gal at the Library and Archives Canada LAC, at the time National Archives of Canada. And that finding aid contains 2,669 numbered objects that is acquired by the archives of Alma Duncan's work. And I thought, oh my god. And, and that's artwork, that's journals, that's Christmas cards, correspondence, a life, an entire lifetime. And, but without copyright permission, all I could access were Christmas cards. I was allowed very, very minimal information. And all I knew of her work at that time was through Joan Murray, who Joan Murray um, it, was the director and curator of the, at that point, and this is in 2001, Joan Murray had curated the only solo exhibition that had toured, that certainly received any kind of attention by Alma Duncan, and its title was Men at Work, um, 48 to 85, and it was three series, Alma's three series of munition drawings and factory drawings. And Joan, it, it, it had toured, it opened at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery in Oshawa, and it did tour to Ottawa, it was at the Ottawa Art Gallery. And so that catalog of her munitions drawings, I thought, okay, she was a war artist, and that's all I knew. And I then became a detective, and I realized that that, because I, I kept coming up against walls. I would ask everyone I knew, anyone, I, I traveled, I visited Toronto University's live, um, archives, uh, the National Gallery. I, I tried to find this woman, and I couldn't. She was quite literally erased from <coughs> this canon, this narrative. And it was at that point that I realized, this is feminist art history. This is a recovery project. And the fact that these searches have to happen, and, and so I very, um, I, I, the following summer was working at the National Gallery of Canada as, a, as a, an assistant, and literally like a, a, an angel, so to speak, a woman appeared at my office door one day and said, I hear you're working on Alma Duncan. Can you come with me? And I, I trusted her, and I followed her to where she is, and she brought me to a woman in conservation named Anne Mayhew. And Anne looked at me and said, I know Babs. Oh. And Babs was Alma's partner. Babs and Alma met in Ottawa in 1943. Alma was born in 1917. Babs was born in 1916. Babs was born in the UK, Alma in, in Canada. They met in, uh, in Ottawa working at the NFB. And they remained living together and partners until um, Alma passed away first in 2004. But there was very little mention of Babs. I, I'd come across the name in some of the writing. And so I, I finally, when, and at the time Babs was 86 years old. And so when I was told, I know Babs, she lives down the street from me, I nearly fell over and thought, okay, I've hit the jackpot. This is it. Who was your source? Anne Mayhew, um, who at the time was working in conservation at the National Gallery of Canada. Now she's um, at the Library and Archives of Canada. But the person who knocked on your door was uh, Anne, Anne Grace. Anne, oh. Anne Grace, who at the time was, I was Diana Nemiroff's assistant that okay. summer. Right. And, and Diana was in Germany doing research, and so Anne Grace was her assistant who was supervising me, essentially. Um, and so it's sort of, it, it just, it was one of those, it was being at the right time at the right place, and, and all I did was talk about Alma. I was very obnoxious in a way. Anyone who came across me, I would talk about Alma and hope that someone would say, oh, 
oh yeah, I have heard that name, and and I, I felt like a detective, and and so when I wa and then then I met Bab. So a week after, and arranged a meeting, and um, it was in their garden home that uh, Alma and Bab shared in New Edinburgh, in Ottawa. And I walked in, and I was greeted, greeted by a great big black dog, a furry black dog, Pepper. And when I walked into the home, there was, and I've I said the story earlier, so I apologize for repeating myself, but there was a room on the left when you walked in. And my, I, I looked in, and there was a desk, and all four walls, it was salon-style black and white photographs of their life together. Mm. They traveled, they traveled extensively in the 60s and 70s. Alma had earned a number of Canada Council travel grants. They traveled through Hong Kong, Tokyo, um, Iran, Lebanon, <coughs> North Afri uh, South Africa, um, the, the North, across Canada. They, it was researched and, 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 and I knew enough at that point that Babs was was a collaborator as well as a partner, but that I didn't see the two as, as separate. I didn't. I, they were they were a duo in in every way possible, um, and so I became very close with Babs. She welcomed me into her home, and gave me access to anything that I needed, copyright permission, um, which it changed my. And at the time, I was writing a research paper for a seminar. It was 20 pages. And I realized, I, this is more. This is a lifetime work. So I decided to write my master's thesis on Alma. And um, so finished that document in 2004. And realized, sort of through Alma, the, that I didn't identify as an art historian. I was al I'm also a practicing artist, and, and that's very important to um, to the work that I do. And so I spent I spent a number of years focusing on my own practice, and and I went to the states, and everywhere anyone who would listen to me, I would talk about Alma, and and you know I probably drove a lot of people crazy. But in 2011, I. Um, I had just started my doctorate at Concordia, and I was at a conference, and Catherine Sinclair and I just happened to cross each other in a hallway, and we had never formally met. And she stopped and said, I, I've heard of you. We need to talk. Mm -hmm. So we set up a meeting for the week, a week later, and it, this was October 2011. And she said, I want to I want to curate an exhibition on Alma Duncan. Can I borrow your thesis? Can I read it? Oh. I said sure. So the following day, I brought her in a box because after so after I finished my master's thesis, I defended it and it was fine. I was pleased with it. I passed, but really my defense was I wanted Babs to read this document, but I I needed her approval. So I brought it to Babs one day, we had tea, and I gave her a hard copy print, mm -hmm. colored images, everything. And a week later, she called me over, and she said she loved it. Oh. And she had a gift for me, and it was oh. an Alma Duncan drawing that she had framed for me. Wow. And then she said, she, at that point, she was starting to transition into a nursing home. Alma was still alive. Alma was diagnosed in 1995 with Alzheimer's. She only passed in 2004, but her Alzheimer's progressed very fast, very quickly, uh, severely very quickly. So she was in a nursing home. Um, and so I, I never did go to visit her. I, I only, only knew Babs. And so at that point when I finished my thesis, Babs was getting ready to move into a nursing home and she said to me, can you organize my basement? Can you archive it? And I said, oh my God. So I went into the basement and it was just boxes and art, filing cabinets and it was, there were slides, thousands of slides. And so I was, I was ordered, these were my directions, everything into four piles, one for the archives, one for the National Gallery, one for the estate and one for me. And so I, Bab said, you need an archive. This is, you know, you are Alma Duncan, essentially. You are going to do what no one has yet been able to finish. And I, I was 24 at the time, and I thought, oh my God, how? How does one, how, you know, how do I do what Natalie Lipsky would have done? Mm -hmm. and, and there was such an emotional component to that. Natalie was my 
my prof she was who she was the reason why I went on to art history and and there was such an emotional component to that so I organized and I had this archive and I <laughs> so brought it all to Catherine and about a month later Catherine went through everything and she called me and she said now I need your help will you curate this with me and I had never curated and in all honesty it was not anything that had ever crossed my mind I was a practitioner I had finished my MFA and that was that was what I was going to do. I loved writing, but it didn't mean that I needed to be, you know, writing is part of my practice as I see it. And so the Ottawa Art Gallery has just opened their arms in welcoming me and have, have provided me <laughs> a, you know, a, a master class in curatorial <laughs> studies and practice. And, and as we started this research and yeah, we found ourselves in basements in Hamilton and Mississauga, <laughs> and one at one point we went down to we were in a home in Mississauga, and we were told to go downstairs because there was a room in the back corner of the basement that had some of her paintings, and so we went down this staircase, and the first painting on the wall was an abstract portrait that had been shot with a gun. And there, there was a bullet hole through the <laughs> face. And I looked at Catherine and said, does anybody know that we're here? <laughs> it, was, it was the most surreal experience ever, this sort of being a detective. And so it, it took us, we decided that we weren't going to rush this exhibition. We started in 2011, and we were going to do this, but we were going to do it well. And we were very fortunate with, with grants, um, that and, and interest from other galleries, Windsor, Sarnia, and and Barley, and and so um, now the next step. Of, so this is the last stop, and everything after this exhibition. So there are 82 pieces, or not 82 here, because some of the work um, wasn't able to tour. For example, her war po posters. So that's what is missing, <coughs> primarily downstairs, um, but. Originally, there were 82 p objects, pieces in this exhibition, and they will all go back to their original collections. 42% of the exhibition is from the Library and Archives of Canada. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the largest you know, acquisition of, of Alma's work. But one thing that, so the next project I've decided, I can't, this can't be the end of Alma. <laughs> it can't, you know, okay, there's a, a, we've co-authored a monograph, fantastic. Um, which is available at the MoMA. The Museum of Modern Art in New York has acquired it, by the way. Mm -hmm. A little plug for the catalog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yes, there's an exhibition. Yes, there's a catalog. But the one thing that I've yet to be able to do is to acknowledge Babs in ways as, as Alma's partner in life, as Alma's, you know, not just creative collaborator, in 2002, I was told by the National Gallery of Canada to not use the word lesbian in any of my writing. Oh. And so that has, you know, it's something that I, I've, been, I, I've been censored in ways that it, it just baffles me. And to, so when Babs passed away a year and a half ago, I, I was actually one of, um, I was invited to be one of her eulogists. So I, I got to eulogize Babs. And, and I thought, you know, here's this, this relationship that I've developed with a woman who I can't acknowledge in my writing in ways that she needs to be. And I was told by various individuals, wait until Babs passes. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a next phase. So the next phase is um, I'm working on a book proposal with another editor. And we have come together through very similar research projects. What, she, what I have done with Alma and, and Babs, by sort of on the sidelines, she did with Claude Cahar and her partner. And so we've, we're now forming a book project that is looking at shared relationships between women in the home and the studio. Mm -hmm. And so this, I will be writing a chapter, you know, if all goes well, um, I will be writing a chapter on Alma and Babs. And it'll be a shared, you know, a shared subject matter. Um, we did dedicate the monograph to Babs. Babs passed away three months before the opening of the exhibition. Oh. Um, she knew about it. She, she had, you know, she passed away suddenly. She'd gotten a cold. We didn't expect her to pass, but she was a very key voice in the development of it. 
she um, get, opened her home to us, photograph albums, stories, you name it. She was so incredibly generous. And so um, while what you see downstairs on the second floor is a retrospective, it's, it's a life's work. The earliest painting in the exhibition is dated 1935, and Alma was 18 at that point. Mm -hmm. And the latest piece is 1991, and it's a portrait of Babs. It's, I'm pretty certain it's the last portrait of Babs, um, 91. So this is literally this woman's life downstairs, but it's more than a retrospective. It is, it is, such, it is such an example of, of a feminist recovery project that what I hope the example that then continues is that it doesn't stop after the exhibition closes. And this is, you know, this is now the next one. How do I figure out how to do that? And that's, it's, it's a challenge, and, um, but it's a really exciting one. And, and, and you know, I, I use the word feminist. I, I ask my students every semester, who's a feminist in this class? And I maybe get one hand up. And, they, and I say, why, why aren't you? And they, there is really these, these misconceptions, and this is, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, mm -hmm. that it's still a bad word and it means you hate men. And, and I want to, you know, there needs to be such a different kind of empowerment within feminist art history that, um, that I, yeah, and so when, that I want to de certainly, you know, work towards, but entangle within this, this, you know, this identity that I have as an artist, as a curator, as a writer, as, as a professor, that I don't see them as, as separate practices, but that they're all rooted within this, this feminist um, you know, politic. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Waffle, when you put yourself into that space to be shot at, was that 24 hours, or did you, did you have like a, between the hours of such and such, like when you were sleeping in that space, were you being shot at? Yeah, that was that was 24 hours for 31 days. I did not leave the space, and that was that was the challenge. It's just uh, sometimes we don't have the choice to leave, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it mirrored very much uh, the situation of my family living living in Iraq. Right. Yeah, wars don't stop at 11 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so. Um, just not to get personal with your PTSD, but uh, wasn't that kind of a trigger? Um, no, I think I think that that added to it. I mean, I have been in in uh, through the Iraq Iran War. I've been through the Gulf War in '91, mm -hmm. um, in the refugee camp, and this is just like adding one layer uh, into that. But I think it, it also. It was, it was a healthy layer but because it brought it to the service and it allowed me to deal with what I have. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I, I, always, I always think it's just like we, 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 we build these uh, barriers to protect ourselves. But there's always a trigger that allowed us to um, erase these barriers and deal with the situation and I think that was one of the moments. Mm. Wow. Powerful. Thank you. Were, you. were you able to track where the shots were coming from? Uh, good question. <laughs> so, 128 countries, and what I did, I uh, recorded every IP address mm. of the shooters, oh. um, and they didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, uh, um, a lot of people try to hack into the server, we run in the program, and uh, in couple instant, I hacked back. I think it was <laughs> MIT when uh, they turned the uh, uh, the gun in an automatic to shoot and destroy things in the space. And I think uh, myself and the team we hacked into one of their computers and we put a post-it on their uh, screen and said, "Stop it! We know who you are." <laughs> yeah, so that was a nice uh, uh, exchange. So um, was there? One country that had more shots than most, or uh, first the state and second Canada. Oh, really? Very yeah. peaceful Canada. Right? Yeah, that's pretty much. Yes, sir. And I figure out it might be. I, I, we didn't know why. It just like it could be the news. It could be the support that project. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> 
and and well, no, but it's interesting that like this is 2004. Uh, 2007. 2007. Yeah. So you see, this is the so at that point in our history in Canada, it's the it's sort of like the heart of harborism. So maybe that might have something. I really didn't know the politics, but I I I know it has something sometimes with the news news. When the project come up in, let's say, somewhere in Europe, or, and I know I start receiving so many uh, people to interact with me, including people who support the project and people who just want to shoot. Also, I think the part of that is there's more Canadians per capita online worldwide. We are, we're fully wired, so, mm. and cold winters and and it became an entertainment for some people, to be honest, you know. Yeah, I probably just yeah. wanted to shoot anything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I remember uh, talking to somebody on the, um, the chat room there, and I said, uh, why are you shooting? He said, well, um, I'm a hunter, and you're in season now, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a humor, right? Well, I remember uh, talking to Jean Chamouna, the Lebanese filmmaker, and he, he said that during the height of the uh, uh, Lebanese civil war, and then up, including like the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, that a lot of people would go to Lebanon as tourists to become part of the shooting. Right? Yeah. So it's in David. So I was wondering, if I was speaking, is it like uh, when you're thinking of this uh, as uh, well, when people shooting, is it you feeling attacked or feeling support? And when nobody, when a uh, long time nobody shoots, do you feel it's peace or you feel you're bored? <laughs> feel abandoned. <laughs> well, it's a good question because good question. it came up immediately. I mean, the second day I start receiving um, hits and I... I I start judging people, and a friend of mine alerted me and said, uh, you can't judge the shooters because they're the ones who made the project, who makes the project work. And mm -hmm. since then, I kind of pulled back and allowed the crowd to control uh, uh, itself. So shooters were doing their jobs, and also uh, peace activists were doing their jobs. Uh, and I, I remember one incident around Memorial Day when uh, all of a sudden the gun turned left and stayed left, and I thought, okay, maybe somebody hacked into the project again. But when I talked to uh, uh, the people who helped me with, um, with the uh, technical issues, and they said, uh, Jason, his name was Jason, he said, no, it seems like you have a group of people dedicating themselves on um, clicking left and denying people from moving. Uh, the gun and I immediately got in touch with them. They said, well, we saw you devastated and we established a group called the Virtual Human Shield. And we're going to stay with you. And I said, all right, as long as you do it manually, it's fine. Mm -hmm. If you don't put program, it's fine. So they started something, um, some type of a movement to, um, uh, to uh, 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 voice their opinion, not only against, against the shooters. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, uh, <clears throat> the carbon sink work with the peat, uh, find that fascinating. And uh, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the darkness of placing a human life value to, to peat. What was the, like, I, I didn't understand the context of that. Okay, so the survey was um, a bunch of scenarios which were all very global, very difficult to visualize. So these kind of collective good things that we want, like carbon sequestering, um, and people had to put a value on it. And it was a very like, vague question. It was purposely absurd. And so you had two options. You could just put like, um, like a price, like whatever, six billion. Uh, you could put a percentage of your own personal income or labor, or you can make your own scale. And the vast majority of people made their own scale. Um, so there's a few people who rank them, like the most important scenarios uh, would get like a one and a two. A lot of people just fought with the survey and stopped like <laughs> using the boxes and just like filled the page with their ideas. Um, like they pushed back against the survey form itself. 
uh, and the few people, like there was all, like a whole bunch of scales that people have tried to invent. So some of them were like, well, how many human lives would they be willing to give up to give like whatever, a 10% reduction in carbon emissions? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so they were equating. Um, so they were gleefully spending our lives, yeah. not their own necessarily. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, so there's, right. I mean, it's part of the question, but sure. it's a little bit of a dark way of looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I mean, I think one of the um, common threads that kind of moves through these presentations is the notion of the conflict and the conflict zone. Mm -hmm. And um, remarkably, like those root cellars look like bunkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And Elman Duncan works and does, does these incredible drawings in munition factories and wants to go and be part of the Canadian war um, painter program, artist program. Um, there's only been one woman who has been. I, I noticed well, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In 1943, Alma, Alma Duncan applied to be an official war, war artist in Canada. And the two pieces that she submitted in her application were paintings that are downstairs of the Women's Army Corps. So the, the, there's two paintings down there. And they were denied. She was, she mm. was denied permission. Well, denied. A.Y. Jackson was one of the advisors on that committee yes. at the time. <laughs> yes. As someone who two years prior, she sat right behind at the uh, Kingston Conference in 1941. Oh, in, in really? the photo, yeah, she's right behind A.Y. Mm -hmm. Jackson. Which but she was, denied, she, was per, she was given permission to be an unofficial war artist, which meant she could go into factories around um, Ontario and Quebec. So she accompanied um, Fritz Brantner, Louis Malstock. Um, there were there were many women who who went out um, onto the what they call the home front for, to document the war effort, but no Molly Lambobak was the only official woman. My guess is because she was married to Bruno Bobak, um, but maybe I'm cynical. <laughs> <laughs> it was a crispy contract. <laughs> So yeah, the, um, Lisa, the, what was your attraction to um, specifically photographing those root cellars in the way that you did? Because, I mean, they really are very haunting structures, um, obviously very functional, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the whole sort of thing of the survivalist kind of project of how to manage under severe conditions and uh, war scenarios and all those, it, it's very evocative of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, very powerful. Yeah. Well, also, uh, what's the name of the uh, heritage World Heritage Site um, in Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, oh, yeah. with uh, the first Vikings land? Mm -hmm. Land some meadows. Right. That, it, it, it felt also that that felt like a throwback to mm -hmm. that also, mm -hmm. and uh, um, yeah, it's neat yeah. that it's in Newfoundland. It, it, didn't you say, Lisa, that's the one where you actually went with that intention to yeah. photograph? Right. So question for Lisa, do you see Windsor using the Indian Road area as a tourism uh, promotion in any way? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's Florida. kind of beautiful, like this sort of suburban landscape garden. Some really houses are kind of follies. You called it a folly, didn't you? Yeah. The architectural folly? Yeah. 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 Lee? Lisa, I'm just wondering if you trace some of the sort of fault lines across the border in terms of what's going on with maroon expropriating land on the Detroit site, but also um, in terms of settlement patterns from Sandwich over to, um, which port is it? Um, Delray. Uh, Delray. Delray, yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the politics of Indian Road kind of started a long time ago. And, and you know, here on, here on Church Road leading up to the 401, which is never connected, I mean, these are big questions around politics and infrastructure that have been around, you know, since colonial times. So, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot going on there that, um, you know, your project definitely taps into. Mm -hmm. But um, as a First Nations person, I can tell you the politics of Indian Road long <laughs> before. Yes. Yeah. Oh, nice. right. right. I think I think in the debate, you get really caught up in the you know the, the border crossing issue, right, and yeah. the, the economic. Question behind it, but I think you sort of lose track or lose sight of the, the deep kind of political problem there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that story. I mean, it spans the border. And mm -hmm. You can't really look at it without thinking. I mean, the idea was to look at. Um, I think feel like there could be like a really deep and amazing research project about that 
Um, but the idea of marginalia was just to spend time in these sites and then see what pieces came out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely touched up against those, but um, yeah, and like obviously hearing about similar things happening on the other side of the border. Um, but yeah, like in terms of in-depth research about all of that, uh, yeah, just brushed up against it more than really getting into it. We got three hands up here, so <coughs> it isn't. Do you want to go first? The, the, the books that you spoke about, uh, it, it, that uh, long mm. book, bookshelves with the white books, are, are, are you planning on substituting the ones that are purchased onto those shelves? Or what, are the, what is the logistics of actually getting the books to? So what we have now is uh, we started with 1,000 titles, and that's 1,000 titles on the shelf. Um, and uh, on Kickstarter, and this is, has a lot to do with logistics of cost of uh, making the book, cost of shipping, uh, it will, um, if anybody donate $25 or more, they get a, a signed uh, edition uh, copy of a white book. And the money they donate, it's going to go and buy a book to replace the book we give them. Uh, then at the end of the show, all these books will be uh, shipped to their owners. Uh, so every white book will be shipped to um, the donors, and then uh, the real book, uh, they will be um, packed and shipped about that. The, the white book is papers, like a notebook, or is it how is it a book? It's, it's like uh, it's a it's, it's a notebook. Uh, there is nothing in it except uh, the title, and there is one single uh, or couple couple paragraphs about uh, the uh, art gallery of Windsor and about the project. That's it. And the rest is uh, hardcover, and then uh, inside all white papers. So anyone here in the room today has this incredible opportunity to be among the first to participate in this project by giving the into this project the $25 or more to acquire a book. Um, and you you will make sure that the choice of the book is the one that is not that is needed, that there wouldn't be repeats, sure right? Be. Oh well <laughs> you together? I'm here. Because you have this I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we reach we come to you with our twenty-five dollars, you take our name. And then yeah, we get a copy of this book. So, so before you leave today, <laughs> you may need to do that. Um, Bless you. So uh, the twenty-five dollars is through the Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so the money that we've raised, you know, many of the if you if you would like a book, set, go to Kickstarter right away. See how many books are left. Yeah, exactly. That's oh, all right. Okay. Because so that so it's not as direct. Book, right. yeah. yeah. So because that's so. how we're collecting the money okay um, and then the books will be purchased with that money okay well thank you for asking that question so that we got a good clarification here that we all don't run up to you three more <laughs> and hand you $25 yes. <laughs> because it's a kind of yeah um, historic relationship here to the um, gathering back of books to the uh, library and which it was interesting because I saw some of uh, the titles Mm. And it's a huge spectrum of titles. I mean, no, exactly, you know, exactly, it's yeah. just it's not all about art. But if people no. have uh, extra books, art and art history books, they are very welcome to drop them here by the gallery. I don't, okay. I, we, I can't promise a white book in return, but uh, I'll leave that to Sir Moy. Uh, that's what we uh, accepting now. We're accepting any book donation. Okay. If you send us the ISBN. Uh, 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 numbers and we're cataloging every one of them and then collecting them and at the end uh, they will be part of the collection that goes to Baghdad. Is it still in the same location? That uh, it is the, exactly. That same, yep, yeah, it's exactly the same uh, familiar, location. Yeah, familiar with that location. Yeah. I just want to ask about, um, now I know obviously you've had the institutional support of the art gallery here. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's what been uh, any, uh, if any, institution of other uh, any uh, institutional support elsewhere other than the art yeah. gallery or no it's it's a great question so uh, so far we have uh, creative time in New York that's an institution uh, supported us with uh, a good collection of book uh, University of Texas stepped in and uh, they are offering us to buy uh, as many titles as we want them to buy 
which is wow. great. They said mm -hmm. we can, we can uh, support, uh, just like give you cash, but if you send us the ISBN number, we'll, we'll be able to purchase these mm -hmm. books. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, somebody from uh, Dubai is opening his uh, collection of uh, 16,000 books to, for us to pick from whatever we want and it will be shipped about that. Uh, but I think the, to me, just like heartwarming um, things that are taking place, uh, uh, librarian who are um, donating their times to build uh, an, uh, the index for the entire library, in, including the books we collect, including the books that are uh, being donated, but also extending that index into uh, having kind of a wish list as, um, uh, and, and a book list as good as any fine art um, uh, for a college in, in the world. And they're using uh, an open uh, source uh, uh, software so that, that will be delivered on a computer or, uh, along with the books. And as soon as the library uh, arrived about that, is functional and up running. Very good. Yes. Hi. I, uh, I just like to share a few thoughts. First of all, how much I've enjoyed the panel. So thank you. Thank you. And secondly, I thought of some other, well, another theme that unites the panel in addition to conflict, which is um, the idea of stream of consciousness that you find in uh, Latin American literature. Um, I've read some literature by Pedro, uh, by, well, Pedro Paramo, of, who's uh, written by Carlos Fuentes, and stream of consciousness is when the past and the present are mixed uh, continually. And all three of you, the past carries into everything that you spoke about. I mean, you spoke about something in the mm -hmm. past, and you go to the present, and then back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And in um, Stream of Consciousness, Latin American literature, it's the same thing. The first time I read Pedro, Pedro Paramo, I couldn't follow it, because I couldn't follow a quote Chronological, I was so used to a chronological narrative mm -hmm. that I couldn't handle how to read a book that was not that way. And all three of your, your presentations, um, I was able to follow it, mm -hmm. but they also are an interweaving of past and present. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyways, that's another theme that unites you all. Thanks. Uh, that that yeah. appeared in The Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yeah. when he talk about so many generations and he goes back and forth. Uh, it could be very confusing and hard to follow. Yes. But I'm so glad we made sense of that. <laughs> <laughs> and Virginia Woolf as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question uh, from... I was just wondering, uh, about the books that you, uh, excuse me, destroyed, was there... Uh, any, uh, or a lot of uh, antique or, or rare manuscripts that... Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of them and uh, irre irreplaceable. And um, uh, when I ask uh, what we can do, uh, they honestly said if we could get these books donated, it's, it's great. But uh, um, uh, at the same time, they, they said, well, what really is important now to the new generation is, uh, is uh, moving forward. So mm -hmm. the book they are requesting is about contemporary art, it's about uh, art history, technical books, lots of technical books about technologies and art as well. In any language? In, uh, or in English or in what languages? There are asking for English and um, asking for Arabic if they are available. Uh, but English is just like uh, the second language spoken in Iraq. Which dates back from that British colonial mandate period. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Uh, position is good sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> second language. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, let's have more than two, though, eh? Yeah, let's have some indigenous languages and lots of other languages. Yeah. The, the Kickstarter that, that you mentioned, where do you find that? So if you go online. Onto um, the art gallery? Or just site. if you go online on just the internet. Kickstarter. Yeah, kickstarter.com. Uh, it's a website. And uh, if you go to, it'll ask you, you know, it'll say find a project or discover a project. If you click on art, 
um, it, w it is actually one of the featured projects. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it will be, I think there are about nine featured projects, and this yeah. is one of them. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I mean, if you ta type the title of the show, it will come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you type the title mm -hmm. of, just like if you type my name, it's going to come up. If you type the Art, Art Gallery of Windsor, it will yes. come up. So just like any search would about that show, uh, it will lead you into the Kickstarter. And we have four more days to go, five or four. <coughs> yeah. So when you go home, you know what you want to do. <laughs> Catherine. Uh, just since we all love books. <laughs> they seem to belong to us, don't they? <laughs> quick, quick plug for the Duncan catalog being available downstairs should you wish to enjoy not only Jacqueline's essay, but all of the authors. And, yeah. and, and, and also, of course, I just want to always plug the Art Gallery of Windsor's ongoing commitment to the books, and we have others available down there, including our new release, uh, Border Cultures, which brings together uh, the three exhibitions in one. And we, we just released that in November, so. Um, among other things, there's much to enjoy, uh, and there's also our online publication program on the web that you can enjoy with your own download if you wish to print. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Keep up the <laughs> wonderful work at the Art Gallery of Windsor and uh, extraordinary exhibitions and publications, and many, many more awards from the Ontario Art Gallery Association. Congratulations on that outstanding bunch of awards that you all got here. Jimmy, thank you so much for oh, moderating yeah. the panel. Well, thank you all for coming out. I want to thank all the panelists and Jamili for um, you know framing the conversation. It's been a really fantastic. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.